food for us. What's the big deal? How do you make one? Let's find out. G'day there, I'm Dana from Piwakoka Valley. Today we're going to dive into food for us. I'm going to outline a workshop that I actually ran. I've got the same notes and um, we're going to go through what is a food forest? What are the benefits of them? And how can you actually set one up at your place? What is a food forest? A food forest is basically exactly what it sounds like. It is a forest that grows food. A food forest is a permanent planting that follows permaculture principles. It replaces the normal trees that occur in a forest with food producing ones. It makes sure that you have food pretty much year round. What are the benefits of a food forest over a monoculture orchard? Food forests are resilient, they're low maintenance, you can grow perennial crops in them which means you get a much earlier harvest. They also increase the growth of mycorrhizal fungi. This fungi has been shown to increase the yields of fruit trees and nut trees. What's the big deal with fungi? Well, your ground will naturally follow a process. To start with, it's bacterial based, and this is where um, most compost live. They're sort of usually that sort of bacterial based. Vegetables and things they are used to growing in a bacterial based soil. As a ground matures and gets more and more organic matter dropped on the top of it, it will slowly start building a better and stronger fungal network. These fungal networks are much better for trees to grow in, and so forest, forest floors are very fungal driven. A strong fungi network has many benefits. Your soil will retain water better and it absorbs it better when it rains. Your plants are a lot healthier and they're a lot more disease resistant. Fungi networks extend the reach of your roots and allows your plants to access a lot more nutrients than they usually would. There are seven layers in a food forest. You have the canopy, which are your tall top layer. Um, in a well-established food forest, these are usually sort of your bigger nut trees. If you're making a food forest in an urban environment, chances are you won't have enough space for these larger canopy trees. So you can often just skip that layer and drop down to number six, which is your sub canopy, canopy layer. Your sub canopy layer is made up of smaller trees. So these can be your fruit trees, things like apples and plums, and pears are usually sort of the smaller sort of trees. Um, some nut trees are smaller like hazelnuts and they make a great sub canopy layer or if you're in town that can be your top layer. The next layer down is shrubs. These are usually a berry fruit. So you've got blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, currant, gooseberries, worcester berries, a whole big range of berry plants that work really well in that shrub layer. It's also a good layer to put in a lot of nitrogen fixing plants. Things like broom, honey locust, uh, in New Zealand we use things like kawhi and kakabeek. The next layer down under your shrubs is your herb layer and this is a great layer to add in your medicinal and culinary herbs as well as any sort of flowering plants that you would like to have. Under the herbs of course is your ground layer. This is where you want things that will nicely cover the ground. Uh, we prefer to use things like strawberries. Under your ground cover of course you've got your root crops and if you've got boggy soil this is a great place to grow things like daikon which will help break up the soil. You can also uh, do potatoes or carrots or horseradish. There's quite a few different root crops that you can grow and they can be a mixture between perennials and annual plants. The seventh layer in a food forest is the vines. So you can have vines that either grow up structures that you've put in your food forest or you can wait until your trees are that little bit more mature and let the vines grow up there, which is what they'll naturally do in, a, in an actual forest. As a bonus layer, there's also um, the layer of fungi, which you can choose to deliberately put into your food forest. How to build a food forest at your place? Well, the first thing you need to do is assess your site and work out just how much space you have that you can actually put a food forest in. If you've got a huge amount of land, obviously you can put in a bigger forest with bigger trees. If you're living in an urban environment, don't let that stop you. You can also, you could make your top layer uh, something like dwarf fruit and then work your way down from there. You need to observe your site and see slope, water runoff, where the water goes, whether you're going to need to add some swales or something to direct the water and to help slow it down. Um, in our area we get so much water that swales would just make the ground more boggy so we're looking at more drainage trench options and then we're going to put in a pond so that we have that area for wildlife and things as well. You need to uh, work out where your predominant wind's coming from and maybe establish some sort of windbreak before you start putting in the rest of your trees and also what trees you already or other plants that you already have that you'd like to keep there. Step two of course is to make a plan to remedy any of the things that have come up in step one and so this might be when you need to get some earthworks or um, put in some cover crops or plant in some windbreaks or even erect some man-made 
windbreaks just to get things started. You also need to think about access to your food forest. How, where are you going to put your pathways? Where do you need gates put in? Step four is to get planting. It might be a really good idea for you to put in cover crops for the first year and just to help the build that soil, break, break out the soil, especially if you have clay soil or if it's been quite wet or even if it's been quite dry, getting a cover crop in there can help add uh, roots to the soil which improve aeration and adds nitrogen to the soil as well as adding organic matter and you can then sort of cut cut the tops off those and let them drop down and then they'll add a natural mulch layer to your food forest floor. A lot of people establish like what we have your food forest with with a thick layer of wood mulch first. The upside to this is it smothers out most weeds. There are some grasses that will get through. Um, it helps establish that fungi layer as quickly as possible. It helps feed the soil for the next many, many years. This is also the time that you might want to put in some plants that may not be long term in your garden. So more, some more of the sort of nitrogen fixes or some of the temporary fast growing windbreak. Plants like tagasis are really good or tree lucerne, they're also known as are really good they grow really fast they help block the wind and their nitrogen fixes and you can cut them down and mulch them or use them as firewood they work really well as firewood as well you have to think about your food forest in terms of time as well as physical space the natural progression of soil is bare soil and then grassland and then savanna with sort of the bigger bushy grassland and the small bushes shrubland then thicket then woodland and then forest so that's probably the progression that your garden will then take your food forest will stay at the woodland stage and this is where there's still space between the trees to walk there's still lots of room for the small shrubby things to grow ground covers still get plenty of light once things progress to a fully mature forest all the underling plants do tend to suffer until a big tree falls out. So what you want to do is keep, keep it back a little bit from forest and keep it in that woodland sort of level. Nitrogen fixes, both perennial and annual, are brilliant to incorporate into your food forest. There's a bit of a debate as to how these plants long-term accumulate nitrogen. Some, of the, some people argue that you will only get nitrogen from them if you cut the tops off, which makes their roots release them. Others say that trees like black locust and honey locust and tegasast will continue to add nitrogen to the soil even as they're growing as trees. You can grow a combination of the above, put some of those sort of nitrogen fixing trees in amongst your plants as well as some of the more short-term uh, things like your peas, your beans, your lucerne, alfalfa, uh, those sorts of things that will grow and then as they die back you, you know they'll release the nitrogen or you can use them as chop and drop so let them grow for a while and then cut them off at the ground and that mulch will also have nitrogen from the leaves just naturally as well as the extra nitrogen in the roots which will disperse. Ideally every plant that you put into your food forest will have at least two functions so you want something that either flowers for the bees and is a dynamic accumulator or it flowers for the bees and it's edible or it's a dynamic accumulator and it's edible. You want everything to have at least two functions. It might be a windbreak but also a food producing crop. Start thinking about different ways to incorporate plants that will do more than one thing for you. Weeds are one thing that we really struggle with in a food forest setting especially as you're getting it going. This is why a lot of people will use thick layers of mulch, but there are actually a lot of benefits to a lot of weeds. Things like yarrow, which grows, or yarrow, depending on how you want to pronounce it here, it grows like you wouldn't believe. It's known as quite an annoying weed, but it's also quite a beneficial plant, and the bees love it. It's also got lots of medicinal purposes. Guilds are kind of known as a big thing in permaculture and polycultured sort of uh, food forests. A guild is simply plants that work really well together and for them to work well together they do need to occupy different levels of space. So you might have a vine growing with a tree and one's a nitrogen fixer and the other one's fruit producing. Um, and underneath it you might have some dynamic accumulators or some root crops or you just need to think about plants that sort of will help each other along and take up different space. You may choose to put in mushrooms as a layer in your food forest as well. There are a lot of wild mushrooms that are edible, but of course you'll have to double double check that the fungi that are growing in your garden are actually the edible sort. You can deliberately put in things, something like a burgundy wine cap. They grow really well in wood mulch. The food forest floor is also a great place to grow some annual vegetables. You don't have to just do one or the other. You can grow shade tolerant plants like lettuce and cabbage and broccoli. And it's also a great place to grow your more sprawling vegetables like squashes and pumpkins. 
you'll probably find that eventually once your food forest is established you have quite little microclimates happening. Some will be shadier, cooler and damper and others will be warmer, drier and much more sheltered. These areas can be great places to grow fruits that you can't usually grow in your area. One of the complaints about food forests is that they can be expensive to set up. But you know what? You can actually propagate a lot of your own plant from cuttings. And learning to propagate from cuttings is a lot easier than you might think. Ask around. Ask friends. A lot of the smaller shrubs and herbaceous plants can actually be grown just from dividing plants that already exist. Especially things like herbs. They grow really, really easily from small pieces. Just be sure not to plant them out too early. You want them to be well established before you put them out to compete with the wild. Make sure that any cuttings you've had have grown to a decent size before you put them out. Another option of course is to grow things from seed. A lot of trees will grow from seed and they do take a couple of years to get properly established, but it is possible. And if you can find the seeds for them online, it's kind of a great way of getting some plants that you can't buy elsewhere. The big keys with starting a food forest is to just let go of the perfectionism. The weeds will be there, Everything will be a bit higgledy piggledy. Um, things will often look like they need maintained. The reality is you're letting this thing go a bit wild. And so you just need to let it go a bit wild. This is not the place for well trimmed topiary trees um, or herbs that are shaped in a, you know, like a bunny rabbit or whatever. This is a place where you're just letting the plants be plants. So where to now? Well, the best thing to do next is to get yourself a map of your property and to work out just how big the area is that you want to put your food forest. Start thinking about the plants that you would like to grow, what sort of plants grow well in your area, and what sort of plants would make really good support plants for those that also grow well in your area. I have a list down below of some dynamic accumulators. Map out your plants on your paper and work out just sort of roughly how big they are. And then the next best thing to do is to get yourself some stakes and go out into your garden area and actually stake where you think the plants are gonna go. That's a really good way of planting those main big trees to work out exactly where they need to go and how they're actually going to fit together. That's also the perfect time to work out where your ponds are going to go and where your access ways and your pathways all need to fit in. So it's always best to do all the planning before you actually put anything in the ground. It's a lot easier to move a stick than it is to move a whole tree. And then you can get someone in to do your earthworks or do it yourself if you're so inclined. Next step of course is to plant up your windbreaks and get those established as soon as you possibly can and to start working on invasive weeds. Grubbing them out and starting from scratch is a really good idea. You might want to do what we did and tarp the soil. We put down some big silage tarps for about six months to help kill off uh, the invasive grasses and that has really helped. Then the next step is to put in your big main trees and then start surrounding them by these supporting plants and put the shrubs in between as well. And then last but not least of course is to mulch. Often you can access uh, free mulch or very very cheap mulch from uh, not abattoirs, from arborists. <laughs> Um, and they will often be able to deliver it to you for free or for a very small fee. Um, and this stuff is perfect, it's got leaves, it's got branches, it's got wood, it's got bark, it's got all of those things all chipped up together, all different sizes, very similar to what the forest floor needs and so you can put a good thick layer of that. Make sure you're not putting it up against, against your tree trunks because uh, you don't want to rot those out but keep them back from the tree trunks but put a big nice big thick layer on all the bare areas particularly on your pathways. You just need to keep maintaining them, prune back the bits that need pruned and of course keep adding plants as you have access to them. You can just keep adding plants as you get them. You don't have to have everything when you very first start. If you've got a lot of bare area you might like to throw in some extra cover crops or some wildflowers or something like an annual clover. And then of course the next thing is to walk through your food forest, enjoy your food forest, and keep an eye out for those harvests as they come up. If you've enjoyed this video, we'd love it if you would subscribe to our channel. We post twice a week videos on growing and preserving your own food. Thanks for watching, we'll see you in the next video.